Welcome to another Precision Fire Repairs video. This, I hope, is the first of a series of videos that I'll call American Flyer Anatomy 101. And what I'll do is take different Gilbert American Flyer products and break them down. It's struck me that sometimes, especially with repair people like myself, the different parts get referred to as though everybody knows what they look like, where they are, and what they do, and that may not always be the case. So, I thought I'd start now with the American Flyer Gilbert Diesel and show you what goes into it primarily. I won't explain in much detail everything because I tried doing that and this video just got much too long. But with a lot of ground to cover, I'll move pretty fast. For more information, feel free to contact me, visit my website, and be glad to help you out with what additional knowledge about this or potential service work it is you'd like done. Thank you. So without any further ado, this is the Gilbert American Flyer Diesel. And <clears throat> the thing that you'll run into, of course, first and foremost with anyone will be the shell. And this is the body. This happens to be one that got re-chromed nearly 17 years ago and it's held up pretty well. The ladders are obvious. There are these things here held on by one or two small pins. And inside you can see what are referred to as the body posts and these happen to be in fantastically good condition especially considering the age of the engine but they many times burst open and need to be repaired or replaced they're the points of connection for the frame that gets put into the shell that then completes the two halves of the engine speaking of the frame this is the frame off that 360 it's a piece of sheet metal that's been formed onto which then the two motor yokes have still been left attached I could have taken these off there's a lock washer here and then they drop out there's insulating washers one on the bottom one on the top and then the frame would have just been the sheet metal you may notice here's a nylon grommet and here's one as well and that's a finishing touch that I install whenever I can to help the rainbow wires that pass through there be protected from the potentially sharp edges of the holes stamped out of the frame but this is a two motor or dual motor dual power truck Gilbert diesel chassis or frame as it'll get referred to and what hangs off the chassis or the frame is one or two of these some Gilbert diesels have one power truck or power unit and some have two like the 360 I just showed you and this is pretty much a complete unit you could attach wires to the field and wires to the armature brushes and this would run uh, this is off an early 360 Alco PA the one in fact you just saw that was chromed and um, the truck is black now I'm going to remove the screws that hold the side frame, the silver portions on the side, by my fingers and make a note there. That's the way I recommend you start these screws, is with your fingers if you can. Um, they're kind of easy to get off angle if you have them in there and tighten with a screwdriver and are met with any kind of resistance. You might be tempted to just hunker down and screw it in pretty tight but actually you want to make sure they start off easy so I prefer to do that with my fingers instead and then the side frame drops away from the chassis this side frame is made up of three different pieces primarily it's the sheet metal spine onto which then the two cast side frame elements are riveted and then uh, some have a pickup shoe box spring assembly on them to make for more positive continuity and contact with the rails there's also typically a coupler attached with a centering spring to help that to return back to center after going through curves or being uncoupled from a car uh, these side frames it's important that they're tight so as to not droop and two reasons not to, is to prevent them from touching the rail heads or anything beneath them and also if they have a pickup shoe box and spring to keep that property aligned over the rails they can be retightened many times by having those rivets crushed tighter 
and um, that way the side frames stay aligned on the spine as they would have been from the factory. This box with the shoe inside it and the spring to make it return down on the railhead is important to have positioned correctly and you can see here there are little points where tabs off that box were held originally to the side frame casting. Sometimes this little tab is popped out. Occasionally you can get it to go back in and if you do then sometimes you can peen these to close back over the tab. Sometimes that metal is missing and the proper adhesive is what you have to depend on to get it put back in. But this is a side frame with a pickup shoe, pickup spring inside you can see and a pickup shoe box attached to the side frame. There's your classic Gilbert side frame. When we look at a truck, this is a fully assembled motor actually, more than just a truck. We have the, the uh, field yoke which holds the field in place and these screws help keep it centered around the armature. You want an equal amount of space around the armature and no way that any of the rotating winding segments of the armature able to hit the field. Then you have um, their mounting screws which are here that holds the yoke in place. Next down you have the actual field itself which is wound with special um, or specific weight magnet wire and when electrified that creates a magnetic field around the armature which excites it in a way that makes it rotate. Uh, here you have the brush on the one side of the motor and the brush in its holder on the other side. Both of them are held against the commutator of the armature with a spring and that's all on a brush holder assembly plate. Uh, the armature is the next thing inside. That is the thing with the three segments of windings that you can see there in bright red magnetic wire. Um, we'll get more into that as we look at the armature separately. These straps are really important. They're the armature bearing hold down straps. One here with nothing else but the strap. This one shares its position with the brush holder assembly. And then on each end of the truck there is a gear cover. Um, this keeps grease from splashing around and gives you some access to the thrust plate and gears if you need it um, by removing that screw. Then you have underneath of course the drive gears and one on each axle sometimes referred to as a spur gear because the teeth stick straight out. Um, and then you have two holes in the chassis into which absorbent oil wicks are inserted. And the idea there is the light oil that is applied to them wicks up into the chassis. The wick makes contact with the armature bearing or bushing as an oil light bushing. Then the light oil helps to keep it fresh and providing um, a proper environment for the spinning armature. So this is a, an assembled truck and uh, hopefully a quick description of the different components you see when you look at one of course you have the wheels. Um, this side happens to be the solid metal wheel. You don't see any plastic core. So this is the hot side of this chassis. These along with a pickup shoe that might be on this side side frame are what pick up the power transmit it up through this uh, yoke post and um, that's what then delivers the one rails power uh, to the motor um, and uh, uh, picks it up to the reverse unit I should say which then distributes it out uh, to both motors and um, this side has the insulated wheels and you can see the plastic core inserted in them over the axle so these metal wheels here may touch the rails but there's no connectivity between the wheel and the axle inside. So uh, real quickly here is what one of those yokes looks like and um, the centering screws used to properly center the uh, field. Here is the thing referred to as the field. I'm going to go through these parts individually because maybe they'll make a little more sense to you or be more familiar next time when you see one. Um, Pick through this tray quickly, but first, of course, cover the ever important armature. This is a worm gear. There's another one on this end. This is an armature bearing or bushing. 
There's another one on this end. These need to be inspected and checked to see if they're badly worn. They can be worn open too far, and even the armature shaft underneath them can be worn too thin. Uh, if it's just that the armature is worn open, then they ought to be replaced as pairs. The worm gears are held on these ends by solder, and you can slip them off and get the uh, replacement bearing slid on, and then the worm gear repositioned and soldered uh, back into place. These are the armature's segments or winding segments, also with magnet wire around them properly attached to the appropriate post, which then corresponds with the commutator segment. And there's a gap to keep the commutator separated and not allow a short circuit. Uh, these connections should be positive. Uh, these gaps should be cleared. These commutator plates should be clean and shiny. But that is your um, American Flyer diesel armature. And now we can go a little bit quickly into the parts. This is a brush holder assembly with its springs installed. This is a brush holder assembly without springs, just simply the bracket onto which the brush holders and the springs that press against them would be installed. This is um, your two diameter axle. It's larger diameter on one end, smaller diameter on the other end. And the serration in the middle is onto which the spur or drive gear gets pressed. This is one of those drive gears or spur gears for a Gilbert American Flyer diesel that I just mentioned. This is a worm gear off the armature and separate. You see the hole clean through it. And the fact that it might be referred to as a worm because it looks like maybe a worm was wrapped around to create the different slots into which the spur gear teeth mesh. This is a brush holder. It's just a little piece of brass with a hole in it on the one end. I'll show you that end with a hole in it uh, onto which a brush gets soldered. And I'll show you what a brush looks like here before it's installed. This is a brush. Um, it's square. As you can see on the end, it's curved to fit the armature. You need to make sure you pay attention to that curvature when you install it and it has a little round peg or nub that goes into the hole in that brush holder. When soldered correctly, um, they're lined up nice, they're square uh, on that holder and they're pressed all the way against it um, so as to be in making perfect con connection and a good steady hold on that holder and not come loose or fall off. This is one of the uh, cover plates that goes on the ends that I showed you. It's just pressed steel with kind of a dome formed into it. This is one of the wicks. This is actually an original Gilbert wick. Many times they're plugged up with old lubricant, but they can be soaked with solvent. And as long as they're made freshly reabsorbent again, can be reused and wetted with light oil. Um, this is a brush spring. Um, sorry for getting out of order there. I'm just kind of reaching into the tray and uh, you can see there'd be two of these as there was on the assembled brush holder. This is an armature bearing and um, there are several different styles of these. Here's one and here's another. What doesn't matter so much is the style of them, but the inside and outside diameters need to be correct. And here we have a um, armature bearing hold down strap that I talked about. It's just a thin piece of copper shaped in the proper way with a little dome here to accommodate that armature bearing and hold it properly in place. And now we have um, a part that I didn't mention, but it's important to. This is the thrust plate. This thrust plate um, goes into the end, you see there's a little notch cut out, and you um, position these into that notch, and it's important. They're like a cushion on the end where when the armature travels back and forth, depending on the direction the engine is going in, it will bump up against these rather than hard metal and provide it some um, 
pivot point and cushioning. They're important to have positioned correctly and not worn out with a little lubrication as well. And everything is held down to a truck with little tiny screws, as you were able to see the heads of them. Um, I like to try doing that successfully with as many of the short version of that screw as possible. And that's the S171 screw. Um, don't screw these down too tight. They're easy to strip. When you come across one that has been stripped, many times what you can do is revert then to the S183, which is slightly longer and threaded the same as an S171 to save the day and um, not have to take any more drastic measures. This is a pickup shoe. I mean, box, pickup shoe box. As you can see, the little tabs that I mentioned to you earlier are there. And um, this is what goes on a side frame. This is the pickup shoe. The pickup shoe travels inside the box, has a limiter tab here so it doesn't come all the way out. And then this is the pickup shoe spring that goes inside the box and the shoe to make it um, push back against the rail with some gentle pressure. And <clears throat> I guess the only thing else I'd like to mention, and then we'll be done, is chassis can be rebushed. They wear out where the axles pass through. And in the original ones like this 360, uh, it came with bushings. The factory inserted them, which was great for the longevity. But later on, um, they skipped them. And there are no bushings in the latter model Gilbert. And uh, for the 360, it's relatively easy to get the original bushings out and replace them with these. I have a video and some photos on how to do that on my website. The latter model can be fitted with bushings, but they need to be very accurately drilled out, the bushings pressed in, and the proper holes in them uh, machined as well. And when they do, then, of course, they're, they're practically like new again. Um, Lionel, when they came out, um, it, she 10, 15 years ago now, originally, um, they had open frame motors as well, and they had chassis with small bushings in them, which was a good upgrade from the latter model Gilberts, and you can pop them out pretty easily and buy replacements of those. Um, I've replaced the original trucks on some of my Gilbert diesels back in the day when these Lionels were available just for the fact that I can preserve these original ones and not add wear and tear to them. This, for example, off a 375 Texas and Pacific Jeep is tight as the day it was made. And I can replace these bushings on the Lionel ones pretty easily um, when I need to. But that's a quick, very quick orientation for you to the American Flyer Gilbert Diesel. I hope that exploded look at things is helpful for you and I look forward to making some other American Flyer Anatomy 101s perhaps about reverse units, uh, steamer chassis and motors and other such things that the Gilbert Company gave us under the brand name of our beloved American Flyer. So until we meet again, be well and have fun running your trends.